Hello, Facebook Live. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, for what I call the quarantine sound sessions. And uh, each week uh, I've been scrambling to put together uh, some entertainment <laughs> for folks who are holed up in the, with their with their kids and, and they're out of work and feeling sad and uh, lonely and um, you know That's a uh, <laughs> feeling sad and lonely. Um, but it is a song, actually. I'll, I'll be right back. I'm going to go write that. Um, but uh, anyway, the quarantine sound sessions have been focused around uh, my newly plug, 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 uh, my newly released book. Well, yeah. Uh, the last seat in the house: the story of Hanley Sound. As I've said, um, you know, we Hanley and I were Bill Hanley and I, who's in the room tonight, Mr. Hanley, uh, mm -hmm. were uh, planning on going on some sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, book tour with this, and of course, like everything else that got flattened. So, you know, thinking creatively, uh, how, how do you get the word out? How do you, how do you share uh, 10 years worth of work without feeling all bummed out that you can't share it? Uh, this, the Zoom platform uh, arrived and uh, Facebook Live, and we've been nurturing an audience on Facebook for a long time. And uh, we're, we're projecting live or broadcasting live on Bill Hanley's Facebook page, which has, which has a lot of audiophile people, uh, people who are interested in Woodstock and the Beatles and all these wonderful adventurous stories and sound and rock and roll and jazz and and um and uh, uh, uh some symphonic sound and, and demonstration sound and it's all in this book so each week uh i've been focusing on a uh, a topic or a subject from the book and um you know i thought wow you know we really have to do something on the beatles you know what already hasn't been said about the beatles right i mean so much has been talked about and we have people in this in this room here that know a lot about the Beatles more than I, um, even though I've I've researched quite a bit. But um, this week this week's topic is Beatles sound, and, and what does that mean? And uh, setting the stage. Well, first off, I should I'll give introduce give I'll give introductions after I kind of mention this is that setting the stage for this Zoom uh, meeting or the Zoom panel of these people who know. Uh, specific things about the Beatles is that the Beatles were having pr a problem with their sound for a very long time, which ultimately, again, tell me if I'm wrong uh, later, not right now, Eric, that, you know, it, it forced them in many ways to just stop touring. Uh, the, the quality of the sound that they were getting uh, from the equipment that they were playing through live and not being able to overcome the screaming fans was not uh, a wonderful experience. Um, so, uh, and that's, that's a very, that's a, I know there's a lot in between, but that is a summary. Uh, and Hanley uh, and, and maybe even some of Duke, uh, two pioneering sound engineers that are in the room tonight, we're faced with these technological challenges. How do we provide the best sound reinforcement with the technology of the day to overcome uh, the adversities of high decibel levels projected by um, uh, screaming fans? So, um, and we'll get into that. And then maybe after uh, I give the brief intros, Eric, you can kind of expand on that. But uh, yeah, sure, I absolutely will, because I can do it pretty quickly. Yep, yep. Yeah, we have Ken Lopez. Ken Lopez has been with us uh, each week. Ken is a, is a good friend, uh, helped me uh, a great deal at the beginning, uh, beginning's research of my book, The Last Scene in the House. He wrote the for a beautiful forward for the book. And uh, Ken is an educator uh, and uh, former VP at uh, JBL. Uh, and uh, if I'm giving super summaries here, but if you have something, uh, if that wasn't enough, Ken, let me know. Um, we have Vern Miller, uh, bass player for The Remains, uh, musician extraordinaire. Um, legendary band who opened up for the Beatles in 1966. Duke Mewborn, Baker Audio, Atlanta, provided sound or was the sound engineer uh, uh, for the, uh, what, what was the name of, it's not, it wasn't Brave, it wasn't Brave Stadium. What, what, what was the, the venue again? Fulton County. It was, Fulton, it was Atlanta, Fulton County Stadium. Fulton County Stadium, that County Stadium that's right. Both the Braves and the Falcons. That's right, that's right, good. And uh, Duke, thank you very much. Duke uh, was there in 1965 and uh, uh, witness the Beatles uh, uh, performing. Um, also, we have Bill Briggs. Um, aside from a keyboardist, Bill, you play harmonica pretty well, too, and you're, you're a damn good singer. Um, remains, uh, legendary Remains uh, performer. We have Tony Griffin. Uh, Tony is, aside from being a fan of the Beatles, he's a, clearly a musician, uh, a wonderful photographer. Uh, and uh, I met Tony uh, 10 years ago. Uh, he, had a, he still has a beautiful collection of photos. How old were you when you went to see uh, the Beatles in 1966, Tony? I was 17. Wow. 
That's incredible. Um, spring chicken. Uh, spring, spring chicken. chicken. Yes, yes. Um, and we have Eric Taros, and Eric's a close friend, uh, a fellow Bostonian. Uh, <laughs> Orange Line, my hometown, um, uh, Somerville, Orange Line. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, Eric is uh, a very becoming a very well known Beatles historian and expert on the Beatles of all aspects. Uh, working on the Ron, as of late, the Ron Howard film, Eight Days a Week. Fine job uh, with that uh, yeah. archival research. Yeah, um, and then we have Billy with us. We have Bill Hanley. I'm here. All right, good. Hey, 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 hey. hey. The uh, uh, the subject the subject of this book uh, it's 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 Bill's fault. This is Bill's fault here. Um, Bill uh, is uh, uh, among uh, of the many shows that uh, Bill has done, uh, which he most famously is known for, is providing the sound for the Woodstock Festival. Bill also provided sound for the Beatles on at least nine dates of their eastern part of their 66 tour. Um, and um, I would say that Bill was probably the Beatles' first touring sound engineer. And there might be some argument there, but I would say that Bill was on tour with a truck uh, and traveling with the Beatles, therefore making him a touring sound engineer. But if anybody wants to argue that, voila! Um, and then we have uh, Mr. Barry Tashian. Uh, what more can we say about you, Barry? Your 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 original rock and roller man. You're the first yeah. punk rocker of your first punk rock Boston punk rock hmm. front. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it remains the remains were in business what two Just years, <laughs> and uh, and the um, air tash. Hey, Bill. Hi. Yeah, and um, after that, uh, I somehow stayed in the music business, and I. I you know, I played with Emmy Lou Harris for 10 years and uh, traveled the world. And um, my wife, Holly, and I went, went uh, did a lot of gigs in, in, uh, in those years. And, and uh, we never ran into Bill Hanley, though, somehow, because we just had two acoustic guitars. That's why. <laughs> that could be it. Well, you did but, go to folk festival for years. I'm really and Newport. Good. Yeah. Newport. Did the Jazz Festival also, didn't you? Which? Did you yeah, do the Jazz, jazz Festival? Yeah. Yeah, sure. One yeah. of the things I always found so interesting about yeah. the remains is that you, Barry, if I remember the story correctly, <laughs> you, um, you saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in February of 64, like so many of us. And, all, and you create this band, you're in college, and the next thing you know, by December of 65, you're on the Ed Sullivan Show. How does that happen so quick? I know. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> dreams, dreams do come true. Flip the coin. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. He, he, uh, Ed Sullivan just came into our gig at Trudy Heller's in the village when we were playing in New York, and he watched us for a set. And he got up and came up to the stage and said, I want you boys to be, play on my show this Sunday. Wow. And he said, oh, okay. <laughs> so. Cool. Well, Vernon and I yeah. tried, tried to write a song and right away. And uh, I think you I, and I wrote the song like the night before the rehearsal or something. Is that did what it we ended up playing? something crazy like that, yeah. We ended up playing that on Ed Sullivan. Yes, <laughs> let me through. Yeah, there's some professional for you. And the go-go dancers. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's get into the, the meat of this. We have a hungry audience uh, uh, awaiting uh, our, our, our stories here. Uh, Chachi Lepret is here. Hey, Chachi, what's up? We'll, um, at some point, we'll invite some uh, special guests into our panel towards the end. Um, and, and, and Chachi, stay on with us for a while. Um, well, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction of this, the, the Beatles were having sound problems. It affected the quality of their performances and maybe the outcome of their, of their live music experience uh, to some level. Um, Eric, um, if you could take us, and Eric, again, is uh, Eric uh, Taros is, is a, a known Beatles historian. If you could in some way summarize some of the issues the Beatles were having uh, in 64 and 65 and then kind of um, 
maybe smattered in that is the show that um, uh, Duke was involved with, but leading up to Hanley, leading up to the remains and what maybe what was happening with the Beatles. Uh, sure, and, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, as we all know, the story of the Beatles, the birthplace being the Cavern Club or the Casbah as well out in Heyman's Green. The Beatles were a, a club band uh, who then became very, very popular within a, a very short amount of time in their home country in 1963. And they graduated to playing theaters. In the theaters, they were dependent upon whatever the sound system was there. They, they had a very small road crew, just two guys, you know, Neil and Mal and a van, hauling that equipment around and had, they had their, you know, Vox amplifiers. And you could just about get away with that on the English theater scene. Suddenly, they leap forward another year and in the beginning of 64, they become a worldwide sensation, not just an American thing, but a worldwide thing. And it was one thing to play on TV. They could be heard, you know, pretty well. They'd still be screaming kids. But what they weren't prepared for, really, was when they came to America, the, suddenly the shows aren't theaters. They're these stadiums. They'd never played a stadium, really. And one of their very first gigs was up in Vancouver, uh, which became a near riot. They had 17,000 fans. And the amplification is kind of what was ever around in the house. And so, you know, it's interesting that I think actually... Barry Tashian had a great line one time talking about it in some TV show where he said, well, you know, modern, real modern concert technology finally got figured out right as the Beatles are leaving the stage. You know, Monterey, you know, all of the stuff, the experimentation that some of our guests tonight have, and, and of course, Bill, they were answering a need that had not been anticipated because... You know, playing in front of 17,000 people wasn't quite adequate enough, wasn't quite loud enough up in, in, um, in Vancouver. The next thing you know, they're playing Shea Stadium, they're playing DC Stadium, 40,000, 50,000 people. Uh, what do you do? You can't just run it through the PA system. So Bill was kind of a, a, like a savior in a sense, because I don't really know, by the time it got around to the 66 tour, everything was a big building, pretty much. There's a couple of smaller places they played, but when I say smaller, like indoor arenas, the rest of it was these mammoth things. Uh, my area, one of my gigs that I'm most expert in is uh, Suffolk Downs. Uh, they announced 22,000 people, but before the promoter died, I spoke with him personally. He says, no, we printed 50,000 tickets. We told the fire marshal that there was 22,000 there, but he sold 40,000 seats, which is why it was probably very loud. But I think Bill has to sit there and look at his equipment and say, how the hell do I get the sound out? And without a roadmap. So I don't know how he did it because a lot of people I speak with will speak well of the 66 tour, especially the one exception in 65 is that crazy show at Atlanta Fulton, Fulton County stadium where you can actually hear the Beatles going, wow, listen, we can he I can hear myself. And they're all excited about how great that was. And John Lennon for the rest of that tour, he'd say, well, we had sound that was good in one, one town and that was Atlanta. So he always said that. So I guess that kind of sets this, the thing is, is to me, how you, uh, one of the romantic stories I love that uh, Bill told one time was about the, uh, the board, the, you know, the, the amplifier running this, the sound system had, was something out of a battleship and yeah. it had this crazy blue glowing tube. And I'm like, oh, this sounds like a science cool. fiction book, you know? So I'll Mercury let you guys vapor. take it from there maybe a little bit. And I well, mean, Mercury, just, Mercury vapor rectifiers and they turn blue when they're working. We'll, so get, into, we'll get into that. That is a romantic story. You, I agree. But there's a couple of points that you make, uh, Eric, is that the Beatles are getting bigger. They're playing bigger venues. And what sort of, it's not like we have big box uh, or sh you know, big box uh, 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 stadiums, or I should say indoor arenas, or uh, they were playing baseball stadiums. This is what could support big fan, a big fan base. Um, but before we get into that, Duke, in 1965, what, what, how did you, knowing what was coming in, you must have heard that they were having problems with their sound. How did you, how did you support that? What were, what were some of the problems uh, that you needed to solve to help the Beatles, and maybe just give us a little bit about what you were doing and who you were working for at that time. At the time, I had not heard that they had problems. Okay. They were coming into Fulton County Stadium, and it was a 360-degree circle, and they sold half the seats, so 180 degrees, and lower and upper half. The um, uh, 
stage was on second base, which is the geometric center of the stadium. And the thing that we were really concerned about was emanating sound. Well, first of all, the, the, the sound system for the stadium was great for baseball and football, voice only, with multi-cell horns spaced around. Sure. Well, certainly, it's not a musical system. But we had other amplifiers in the system that had outlets on the field so that we could run speakers on the field. And we could use the console that ran the system. It was an Alltech 250 SU broadcast console. And so we uh, were worried about being in the center of the field because of everything coming right back at them. So the sound system consisted of, as I remember, 12 Alltech A7s. Uh, each one, uh, each group of six of them had to cover 90 degrees. And they were right at the stage left and right of it and bent to cover their 90 degrees. And then because of the echo, we put in front of the stage a uh, sound column for pointing right back at them. And with a separate amplifier on the field that was controlled by a technician on the field. And he uh, uh, adjusted the level of the sound column so that it was just below the threshold of feedback for the main sound system. And so that, that's what the sound system comprised of. You know, the amount of power was probably three, four, three or four watts total. For the all the A7s, that's all, you know, the A7s are only 30 watts piece. They uh, didn't take it. But you could hear. And uh, uh, certainly by today's standards, I mean, it's, it's, it's a joke. But they heard, and the people heard, and, uh, uh, and they were happy. Brian Epstein was very happy. And uh, uh, and the Beatles could hear, it, which is what made them happy. That, that was it. Yeah. Um, the um, that show, uh, Eric, uh, didn't Paul McCartney or John Lennon say, "Wow, we could hear now"? Yes. Something? Was there? So what did he? What did he say? You... Oh, uh, we. Well, I, the, the, the exact quote was, "Wow, loud net like that." You know, that's yeah. loud. They, I think they were just so excited, you could sense. There's not film really there's very very little film of this happening but there's a great tape there's a great board tape of the entire show and um uh, it's actually it's it's interesting it's the last time they ever tried to sing uh act naturally they had just started the tour they had done uh the shea stadium gig they'd done uh the ed sullivan show which was not going to be shown until september uh but things kind of um, i think sound wise went downhill after that because there were was commentary uh, as a, in Chicago, I, I remember where they played an outdoor baseball stadium again, where they played an afternoon show in the daylight and an evening show. They did comments, uh, that, and you could tell the frustration in their voice uh, that they said, yeah, well, 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 you could hear us in Atlanta. Because I think the reporters were starting to, a little bit of hostility was starting to brew, like this is the Beatles' fault. And it until the 66 tour, they never had the same sound system going city to city. So it, it, everything was trying to figure it out. I'm sure if Epstein could have figured a way to, to take the, the Atlanta sound system with him for the rest of the 65 tour, I think the progression uh, would have happened quicker. And maybe, maybe it, you know, why they never really figured this out until Bill came along, don't, don't really have an answer for that. It just seems like Bill Hanley's. It was before people had these enormous, you know, 10 years later, Paul McCartney is with wings is going across the country. He's got like three semis with, right. you know, 30 guys on the crew. Everyone figured it out in the meantime. But like I say, Barry always had that great line about the modern concert technology being invented as soon as they left the stage. And, and, yeah. uh, well, they, and the, they, you know, they never tried really to, to do deal with the sound. I talked I to Brian about it, but I chased Sid Bernstein around who was a promoter in New York and the year before when I first heard about them and he wouldn't do anything about it. He just said it's their thing. Was certain, certain gigs must have been harder than others, Bill. I'm thinking Shea Stadium in Atlanta. Well, Atlanta, it's coming like 180 degrees, but Shea Stadium was like all around. It was coming from... No, about 300 degrees, 270. 
Oh, God, that's right, because the back was open in those days. I forgot. They didn't finish the, the circle. So let me, let, me ask, let me ask Ken Lopez a question. Ken, uh, you know, you've been uh, teaching this, uh, these concepts and theories for a long time. And uh, what, what can be learned uh, about sound reinforcement from this era of um, rock and roll exhibition in a baseball stadium, in your view? <clears throat> well, first, I, I was there along with most of the rest of these guys at, at, at the same period, learning how to do, being a musician, playing in a band, inventing as we went along. And, and uh, I think it may have been Duke who said it or Barry, but um, that we were just trying to make do with what we had. And part of the reason for Bill's success was he latched on to theater loudspeakers fairly early on. Um, and invented a lot of the basic components of the modern sound system. He was the, you know, I once uh, was at a major dinner, I mentioned this last week with Stan Miller, but a dinner when I was at JBL, we hosted a dinner with all the big sound companies, and I asked, who in the room invented the mic snake? And every hand went up, including mine, because we all were inventing these things independently. Bill did it about 10 years before everyone else. But we were all trying to invent those things. Duke, you, you pointed a speaker back at the stage. That may be one of the very first stage monitors. You know, but once again, you're trying to uh, solve the problems as they come along. The equipment was <clears throat> nothing specifically made for these purposes. So everything was adaptation, everything. We had learned the necessity of having a monitor speaker from a lot of the football stadiums we did, which generally in a football stadium, the cluster of loudspeakers were one in. And they would always want somebody important out at halftime to talk about an award the school had gotten something like that. And they are a long ways away from the cluster. And they try to go out there and talk and have a very difficult time due to the time delay. And so in the stadiums that we were involved in, we would always insist upon a monitor that we could set out next to the people when they moved a microphone out at midfield so they could hear a monitor and concentrate on that and not a cluster that's 150 feet away. Mm -hmm. And it worked great. And so the same thing worked in the Atlanta stadium. We knew there was going to be slapback from the circular stadium back to where they were in the center of the circle. And so we provided monitor, a monitor for that. Do you remember what the speaker column was that you used? I don't remember. It's something we had in stock, and, uh, and it was a. It wasn't an actually sophisticated one, but it was. Uh, on there were a, only a few available. Maybe a Bozak or an Alpec or. I, I don't remember. I don't. Remember. It looked a lot like a voice of the theater. I mean, I, there are a couple of pictures from Atlanta where you can see the sound system. It looked like almost like a voice of the theater turned on its side, but I'm I'm doing that from memory now. I don't think so. The the. The, all of the loudspeakers in the in the main for the for the stadium were all tech A sevens. So there were six on each side of the of the uh, of the stage, and they were splayed to cover ninety degrees on each side. Uh, I don't remember what the what the sound column was. I think we we had a chair sitting down and we put this it on a chair facing back at the Beatles. You told me that a chair. It was I thought was amazing. Um, yeah. So to, to, in, in moving forward, uh, we reached 1966. You know, Shea Stadium gets a lot of, uh, of focus. Obviously, it's New York City. Uh, most things in New York City uh, or involving New York uh, get a lot of spotlight. Uh, but um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read a little bit uh, from the book regarding uh, these issues uh, with public address systems in uh, baseball stadiums, in particular, some of what the Beatles. We're facing. I'm not going to read a lot, but um, I think it's some important stuff, and it also segues us into what the remains uh, we're about to to deal with, and of course, Bill Hanley's involvement with the remains. How Bill got the gig, you know, miraculously without not knowing if he got paid or not. I think you told me that, uh, uh, Vern. Uh, we don't even know if Bill got paid. You know, he just came out there. You know, but you know how uh, you know. Uh, he, he, these, this is how you get a gig, right? You kind of volunteer your time and then eventually they need you and then uh, you're on the payroll. But uh, I'll keep it quick. Uh, this is a chap chapter 16 uh, from the last seat in the house. Uh, uh, the title is The Beatles. I, I love this title. Uh, the Beatles face a feverish pitch. 
but public address systems of baseball stadiums prior to the Beatles invading America in 1964, the quality of live sound in the United States or abroad at any given venue was arbitrary and unpredictable. Often musicians relied on an instrument's amplifier to compete with louder acoustic instruments. For instance, a guitarist in a big band might overwhelm a horn section. In some cases, vocalists plug directly into the guitar amplifier, utilizing it as a PA. Uh, but most often, a band used the primitive PA system, public address system, the venue offered. Uh, if they were lucky, there might be a small speaker cabinet uh, on stage or two for larger PAs powered by a low wattage amplifier and a few vocal microphones. Plain and simple, there just wasn't enough power if you had a sizable audience to reach. After the advent of high powered, high fidelity equipment in the 1950s and 60s, we see distinct changes occurring in how rock and roll music was reinforced with sound. In the 1960s and 70s, the requirement of better sound systems becomes even more apparent as the music business evolved and good sound became expected. Back then, the Beatles did not travel with the public address system, as you said, Eric, in the United States. And their performances in enormous stadiums gives us a good example of the requirement uh, for additional power in large, larger settings. In many, ways, the, the, in many ways, they were the band that set a standard for how good concert sound should be by showing how bad it was at these venues. According to Ringo Starr, quote, now we are playing stadiums. There were all those people in just a tiny PA system. They couldn't get a bigger one. We always use the house PA, end quote. The need to get louder was mostly evident during the Beatlemania phase, which began in 1963 and continued through their final tour of 1966. Of course, Beatlemania, however you interpret it, could go, could go on beyond that. We're still there's still be Beatlemania. That fandom even lasted through the 1970s, although the group had disbanded by then. When Hanley met the Beatles on their last go around in 1966, his friends from Boston, Barry and the Remains, with us today, uh, were the opening act for the Fab Four, performing in front of some of the largest audiences of the day. Sound reinforcement for baseball stadiums was a challenge for Hanley. The Beatles' performances Hanley supported occurred in the same year he did Sound Blast 66 at Yankee Stadium and the Batman concert. How terrible is that? At Shea Stadium. Uh, these were baseball stadiums, right? Uh, close friend of the Beatles, uh, Tony Bramwell, reflects on the issues the band faced with stadium sound in his book, Magical Mystery Tours, My Life with the Beatles. Quote, in those days, the PA systems were adequate, except in stadiums where they were hopeless. The whole industry from recording to playing to marketing was finding its feet. Still so basic that it almost, that it is almost unrecognizable by today's standards. Uh, and there it is. The quality of sound was was shit. They were relying on stadium sound or intermittent experts that would show up at a venue with good equipment. And let's move on to the remains. Barry and the remains. How did you meet Bill Hanley, sound engineer extraordinaire? Maybe maybe Barry. John Sadukas. John Sadukas uh, turned us on to right. to Bill, and. Uh, we went out there and met met him and and Terry, and uh, every time we had a gig, you know, either Terry or Bill were, you know, had plenty of time to come out and set up a few mics and and uh, you know, kind of got a little better each time. And uh, you know, we we just we just loved having it because it you know it made our sound uh, like a hundred percent better <laughs> you know than those horns we were talking about earlier what kind so, of venues were you guys playing barry when it was this just around boston you mean or had your uh, when you by the time you met barry i mean by the time you met bill had you started to sort of branch out from just playing you know around boston College. oh well there was still still boston going on but i think we were starting to go to colleges weren't we Vern? yeah college concerts we're, yep. we're, yeah, that's that, what that whole industry was starting to boom. Yeah, and HT John Sadukas was booking yeah. us in in uh, in all of them. You know, a lot of colleges. Yes, I think it's important. You know, <clears throat> when you played in a rock and roll band back then, it was kind of a given. You never heard yourself except your instruments. And if you played in a loud <laughs> rock and roll band, <laughs> you really never heard yourself except the instruments. And we, you know, 
amplification was, was growing in power. And we were getting larger and larger amplifiers. And there was nothing to compensate for that on the vocal side until Bill came along. And then all of a sudden, not only could you hear all the instruments, but you could hear all the voices. And that made a significant difference. Yeah, I remember one, one gig, uh, uh, I forget if it was Bill or Terry, I said, what's that microphone? He said, oh, that's a, that's a television mic. I don't know. Must have had all these things hanging around the office. So, um, okay. you know, I just a, a point there. You made a good point uh, that the the amplification was growing. Yeah, the instrument amplification. And at the time, you were you were worried about projecting your instruments out to the audience, no matter how loud that was. That was on you with your own portable amplification. Um, if there was a sound system, it was mostly for the vocals and maybe one mic on the drums so you could hear the snare out in the audience. Um, I remember in the, in the, 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 the kind of space race for po amp power, owning a sound company on the West Coast. And in 1970, 71, I remember doing a, a smallish 10,000 people festival. And we had <clears throat> built a bunch of solid state amps using the schematics out of the RCA transistor manual. And we had, we had piles of these hundred watt amps. We had 10,000 watts. And I thought, finally, we're going to be able to overpower, you know, get, get the sound system out in front of the uh, musicians amplifiers. And I was a musician. I played loud myself. Um, it did. This show, the, the, the Chambers brothers were the headliner, and they had, they unloaded a truckload of amplifiers, a truckload. It went all, it made a wall all across the back of the stage, and I went back and counted. They had as much power on stage as we had for the amplification system. They had 10,000 watts of amplifiers on stage. <laughs> And I just said, we'll never win. We, you know, this is like, it, it's, it, it's almost impossible. But, but, you know, eventually the sound reinforcement systems pulled ahead and the musicians started to realize that it was to their benefit to throttle back the onstage sound so that the resultant sound in the audience was clear. But it, it took about 10 years. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of loud, uh, the remains uh, from my research were known to be loud uh, above and beyond any other band of the day and uh e even said by uh john landau uh who uh as we know uh, went on to write a very famous article and become the manager of bruce springsteen and at the time landau was at brandeis living in waltham and he had a band called jelly roll and he started this band because he was inspired by the remains and he tried desperately to uh, get signed and to get gigs through HD Productions and John Sadukas, uh, but failed miserably at that. Uh, I heard the band was good, but uh, just not as successful. Anyway, uh, Lando loved the remains. I think Springsteen might have played some of your tunes at, at one point. Uh, he did Don't Look Back at yeah. uh, um, Fenway Park. So cool. Yeah, what an honor. Um, so, and this is very brief. Uh, in 1967, Crawdaddy Magazine article, rock music critic John Landau emphasizes his, this distinct characteristic about the band being loud when using a Hanley sound system because Landau was seeing the remains at many of these, con these college uh, gigs. You know, it wasn't a national uh, booking uh, agency. It was a regional. They were focused on the area, the college circuit at the time. And, uh, you know, I've interviewed Sadukas and Fred Taylor many times about this. Um, so uh, Landau emphasizes the distinct characteristic about the band. When using a Hanley sound system, Landau had witnessed them uh, perform early in their career and became inspired by their sound. A musician himself, Landau, looked to Sadukas for representation for his band Jerry, Jelly Roll. It was in 1964 at one of Sadukas' subsequent, quote, college packages at Brandeis University where Landau saw and flipped flipped for Barry and the remains. I, I suppose flipped means he really, really loved you guys. Um, and this is, this is a, a block quote. When they were introduced, they ran on stage. 
plugged mm -hmm. into two Fender guitar amps through which they were running all of their equipment and two microphones and smiled. Four soft syncopated chords and they broke into their first song at a volume, which was for me beyond belief. It was, it was there when people started yelling for them to turn the volume down and Barry just stood there grinning and said, hey, this is our volume and then broke into some ear splitting hard rock piece. It was in this, it was in the embryonic stages, but it was all there. Barry, you remember saying that? <laughs> Uh, vaguely, yeah. <laughs> say yes, say yes. <laughs> I'm going to take it sitting down. <laughs> guys, I, I remember watching uh, Peter Wolf introduce you guys at the beautiful <clears throat> Regent Theater in Arlington. And he was telling a few stories and he said, the last thing he said before you guys came out on stage was, he says, when you're sitting backstage at the Boston Garden with Bruce Springsteen, all he wants to talk about is the remains. So that was from somebody who obviously sat, sat there and, and had those discussions. I know that you guys influenced a bunch of people. There's a really funny bootleg tape around. Uh, it was made by a lawyer in Canada who made a mini audio documentary of taking his family to see the Beatles at Toronto uh, Maple Leaf Gardens the night before you played Suffolk Downs in 66. And it, there's a really kind of funny part when you guys come out on stage and you guys came out on stage a lot because most people don't remember that you were backing up the Ronettes and you were backing up Bobby Hebb. So you had to do three sets every night. Um, hope you got triple time for that. And uh, anyway, this lawyer who's got this charming Canadian accent, all of a sudden you guys come out and he's like, oh, you know, us loud, you know. So, it, you know, it's it, obviously that was something people you guys were kind of almost the next move over in, in what I mean by that is the Beatles created such a buzz. They needed technology to be invented so they could be heard. You guys were now taking that greater amplification and saying, okay, let's get even louder. Let's like really push this thing loud as part of the aesthetic of the act. I mean, is that, that was a conscious decision, I think, was it not to get louder? It was fun. <laughs> yeah. I think it just happened. I, I, I think it was just us. I, I, it's nothing we ever discussed or thought about, I don't think. We just, uh, the kind of music we were doing seemed to need that kind of energy. And we just cranked it and had a ball playing. You had a loud drummer, too, so that might have oh, been Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention that um, <clears throat> about the loud drummer. Uh, <laughs> we'd listened to uh, some of the uh, early Stones records. And Barry had been in Europe uh, the summer before I came up to Boston University, and he had uh, heard some bands playing over there. But one of the things that Barry did uh, was push the drummer really hard and, and get Chip, the drummer, to hit that snare drum really hard, which really drove the band. And it's really hard to find drummers that will do that. So... Uh, working with chip uh it it made the volume louder yes but uh you know you have to remember that i mean when we first started playing i was playing a fender um, excuse me a uh, a wurlitzer electric piano with its little speaker in the front barry was playing his fender concert with his guitar plugged into it and his microphone plugged into it mm -hmm. uh and that was the sound system so at the end, again, people thought we were loud for it, which we find kind of hard to believe because we weren't really that loud. But uh, later on, you know, when uh, Doran Sun Sundholm uh, invented these Sun amps, S U N N amps, uh, we, I think we got one of the first two, and and Barry and Vern got them. Yeah. And of course, I had to keep up, so I got my rig, my my Vox uh, Beetle which I blew up immediately and put a, uh, an extra, uh, an extra speaker cabinet up on the top of a Fender amp with a Fender Showman. It was a, it was a tower of power. Uh, and we, uh, we, we were pretty loud by that point. And, but it's, it sounded right to us. It really did. And uh, like <laughs> Bernd said, we were having a ball. Let me ask Tony Griffith, Tony, you were there. It was 1966. Hello, Tony. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. And, um, uh, uh, you know, I just want to ask you as, as a fan, 
and, and not a female fan, not that there is any, you know, distinct difference, but there's a reason why someone goes sees, sees the Beatles if they're male or female back then anyway, now I guess it doesn't matter, but then, you know, the Beatles, from what I hear early on, it was just fandom was female fandom, screaming girls. But towards, towards that final tour, I heard it was a real mix of, uh, of gender in the audience. Um, you know, I, it was, was. I was corrected several times by my uh, co-editor, Alan DiBiase, who, um, you know, is just a dear friend, dear colleague, and really helped me get through this book. And I learned so much from him. He corrected me several times. You know, he's like, it's, it wasn't just all female it was it was a mixed uh, audience and for you being there as a as a as a fan um did you notice the loudness from the remains was there a, a emphasis on loud uh, with 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 the remains maybe the screaming wasn't as much because of the beatles didn't come on yet i mean what what do you recall well what i recall is first of all i was in the nosebleed, nosebleed section to start with Believe it or not, I only paid four dollars and fifty cents for the ticket, rather than splurging to five dollars and twenty-five cents for a better seat. So, <laughs> I started off up there, and actually, I could hear things pretty well, but I couldn't see very well. And I did have a good camera with me, with no telephoto lens. So I started moving down, and I'm listening to the volume. It just sounded fantastic. I was a guitar player for the last the previous two years and we were covering Beatles songs and stones and all the things that kids did in those days garage band and i i was impressed with the quality of the sound and i still to this day when i hear the song but Beatles, oh dear what can i do babies in black i remember saying holy shit i can actually hear them and I was down pretty close to midfield at that point. But it, starting off up there, the remains sounded good. I just, had a, I just wanted to see it better and, and even hear better. Cool. Thank you know, Tony, you. I, I was going to say, I think you got to see something very special. By the time the 66 tour rolled around, I think Mr. Epstein was really giving value for the money. But without question, that was the best lineup with the Beatles that ever toured for support acts. Because you had you had the next thing that was happening, The Remains. You had Bobby Hebb, who had arguably the biggest hit that summer with Sonny, and you know he was riding that at, at the top of the charts. You had The Circle, who had two hits that summer. So they had Red Rubber Ball, the Paul Simon song, and they had uh, Turn Down Day was just out as a single. And then of course, for all those dads who were so nice, the eye candy for the dads was the beautiful Ronettes, not with Ronnie, but still the beautiful Ronettes. And, uh, and so, you had such a variety of actual hits and great talent on that tour. Bill Hanley, was that a, a challenge? Did you do anything different for the other bands? Like, you know, the Beatles are going to come on and it's going to be, wow, you know, but did you do any adjustments because you've got, you know, three girl singers and then you've got the circle who are kind of like the Beach Boys, heavy vocals. You know, what did, uh, any, any memories of that? Well, just trying to override the crowd noise level was the main thing, and then get a balance of it. And we just, uh, we finally got uh, uh, footlight, mic footlight monitor speakers with, uh, for Buffalo Springfield when they rented a system from me, and then they, they were not on tour anymore, and then they didn't send the sound system back, so I flew out to Monterey and to see... Uh, Buffalo Springfield down in Los Angeles and then well you we can't hear the, ourselves so then I turned the the speakers up and faced them right in the back of the microphone so you get maximum gain before feedback and that's what I thought about you know I wasn't privy to this stuff at to rehearsals they wouldn't uh, it was hot enough to get a sound check that didn't come until later we just kept pounding on them to let us sound check everything and get everything working together. But it was an uphill battle. So Ice Chase did Bernstein around for, uh, you know, two and a half years to try to do the Beatles at Chase Stadium. And well, gonna, that was going to lead me to my next question to you, Bill, is that in 1964, while at Newport, you were being interviewed. And let me tell you something. Uh, journalists don't write about, they don't really write about sound like they did in the 60s. So 
it was an anomaly. I mean, there's so much rich uh, information and history uh, just through pure uh, journalism, uh, you know, reporters being enamored by a sound system. You'd never get that now. Nobody really gives a shit. It's something that we've taken for granted, right? Um, for the most part. But, um, you know, in 1964, I, I don't have the quote in front of me, but they were at, the reporter was asking you about the Beatles and it, you alluded to the point where you were chasing them at some point. You, were, you, you wanted to uh, support them uh, with sound reinforcement. At any time, and also for you, Duke, was there, uh, and you, well, Duke, you mentioned that you hadn't heard they were having sound problems, but Bill, did you, did you realize that they were having sound problems at, like Newport? You knew they were having sound problems at Newport. Did you realize that the Beatles were having sound issues before providing sound for them? No. Reinforcement? No? Okay. They didn't try to work it out of, you yeah. know, call me in, in front. I get called in and uh, bang, we're on. <laughs> yeah. And Duke, you said you hadn't heard any of any issues at all, right? I had not heard about it. Yeah. And, uh, at the end of the concert, Brian Epstein asked if we would travel. I'd travel with him. And I, I, you know, I had a business to run and I, I just couldn't, I wrote some notes to other people that he was, other places where he was going and I told him some things I'd done, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what would happen. This is, um, this is all really rich. Um, this is an exciting uh, panel. Um, and I want to thank you all for, for joining us tonight. I think at this point, so we have, we've almost, almost closed in at one point. I had a hundred people watching us on Facebook live. That's, that's cool. That's very good. Um, uh, and I want to thank everybody on Facebook live, uh, for joining us tonight. If you're just tuning in, as they say, uh, this is the quarantine sound sessions focused around, um, chapters from my book, plug, 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 the last seat in the house, the story of Hanley sound, Mr. Bill Hanley, pioneer sound engineer, uh, we have a, a unique and diverse uh, and very talented panel with us tonight, uh, all focused around relating to uh, the Beatles. Uh, and we all know who the Beatles are. And um, with a focus on sound uh, and performance, production, and other elements. Um, we're going to take questions. People have tons of questions on here, and I'll go into them at a, at a certain point. But we have some photos to show, and I have a six-minute clip from the documentary I've been working on <laughs> that is focused on the Beatles. I'd like to show Holly, that. you want to see this six minute clip? I, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's his. Yes. Uh, and this is, so this is a student, this, I'm not a filmmaker, I'm a, a digital storyteller, let's put it that way. Um, but I've been working on this film for about 10 years. I, I, um, I recorded and shot all of my footage while studying for my uh, degree uh, and um, have you know, basically just amassed all this information. So now it's coming together and uh, I'm gonna show this to you. So just let me know if, if, if you guys have any issues with this um, being uh, the quality of the sound on this or, or the visuals. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot here. So give me a minute. <clears throat> High tech stuff here. I know. Yeah. It's true. Let's see. All right. All right. Can you all see that? Yeah. yeah. You get a worse desktop than I do. Got a big black screen. Yeah. yeah. What do you yeah. think so far? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> are you impressed? Bill Briggs, are you you're from my first critic? Are you impressed? Two thumbs up? Or you Absolutely. Oh, good. Well, all right. All right. You're easy to please. Let's show your black screen. Two thumbs up. All right, here we go. This must be dark humor. <laughs> See that? Oh, yeah. Okay. remember those days uh, and that was for the Beatles they, that was where they were really trying to do well let's really kick it up a notch this is the Beatles so it was horrible they really had no idea yet what to do but if you pay close attention you'll see a ring around the stage of simple column speakers like you'd have in a um, hall for a hundred people or 200 people. The Shea Stadium 66 was very different visually 
uh, very different technically than the, the, than the solution from, say, Shea Stadium 65. I think Bill's show probably was actually heard better by the, the crowd sitting in the stadium. Already have a hit over there. I know you're gonna dig him, because they already dig you. So a nice big welcome to the remains! Well, the Remains were a, a, a band, a very interesting band, a local Boston legend. Uh, they were formed in 1964. They were a bunch of BU kids. Outside of their fan base, they're most famous for opening the entire tour of the Beatles' last concert tour of the United States in 1966. There was no sound system. No, and Barry played it, plugging his, he plugged his guitar into his amp. I mean, with his microphone, two channels, that was it. Both Bill and Terry were at the very beginning cutting edge of the evolution of live sound. And it grew from there, and I think the reason why it grew so much and so quickly, I think there were a lot of the reason why it grew so fast and, and yeah. became such high quality. We were loud um, for, for the time, and it was with Bill and Terry Hanley's help that we were loud because they, they uh, set up their good sound systems for our vocals, which means that no matter how loud we turned our guitar amps up, uh, the vocals could be heard. And that was a new thing. Drove to Chicago, went to the venue, set up his sound system on the stage. Then the union guys over there who had this ancient sound system that probably, you know, had steel horns way up in the ceiling somewhere said, whose stuff is this? You can't use this. But Brian Epstein came out and he, uh, he said, let me see, what's this sound system? This is like state-of-the-art stuff. He says, we're using this. So the Beatles used, we like to say, the remain sound system, but it was Bill Hanley, Bill and Terry Hanley's sound system. So he literally got in his trailer truck and drove out to Chicago and set up his gear. He didn't even ask anybody. He just set it up. This huge tractor trailer pulls up with this humongous sound system and Hanley and a crew start unloading the sound system and Brian looks at our manager at the time, John Curland, and says, oh, our sound system is here. And John Curland looked at Brian and said, no, that's the remain sound system. And basically, now will our equipment fit on the plane or should we use all of yours? <laughs> so we ended up using all the Beatles equipment for the whole tour. I had only, I'd never seen anything like it in my life that the kids started making so much noise because the girl beside you was screaming and she was screaming so loud that you couldn't hear then you screamed and this all happened to 42,000 people at once. I, every show that I did everybody was fairly quiet and paid attention to what was happening musically on the stage. The Beatles, it was pandemonium broke out because they got so excited people jumped off of the balconies and crippled for life and it was pretty bizarre. I mean, I couldn't tell the sound system was going. They were making so much noise. And I was in the dugout, and I could see the mercury vapor rectifiers winking at me. So I knew the amplifier was working like hell. I think I had an oscilloscope on it to make sure that it wasn't going into distortion. And I had it all distributed around to try to bounce the reflected sound up to the seagulls in the sky so that it would reduce the reverberation time and we get better intelligibility. That was certainly an overwhelming kind of situation and the equipment we had then isn't as loud as the equipment we have now. Incredibly loud. The screaming was impossible to overcome. I don't believe Bill or anyone else anticipated the levels that were coming off the audience. Uh, the gals screaming, so many of them all at once. Equipment, well let's put it this way, I don't think anybody really 
uh, had equipment in their rental inventories or in their bag of tricks that was designed to handle something of that level. His technician, he was great. He, he did what no one else at that time had done. He worked wonders. He was an expert. Good job, dude. Nice, nice John. Yeah. Very that nice. young guy at the beginning? <laughs> yeah. So I have a question for Bill. Shoot. How much total amplifier power were you using, and how many speaker clusters were there? Do you recall? Uh, no, I don't read really. Um, in the uh, book. I'm just kidding. <laughs> In the book, yeah, there we go. I, I think when you spoke at one of my classes at USC, I, I think you you tossed out a number of something like 600, amp, 600 watts. RMS and the big power amplifier, yeah. Yeah. Probably, and the auxiliary amplifier is probably about 1,000 watts. Mm -hmm. Some of the traveling groups, are, yeah, is, like I've seen go to football stadiums uh, will carry as much as a half million watts. Yes. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Eric, did you want to show some photos or show some clips? You know, I, I had, uh, I think actually you showed a better ones than I had to show. I mean, I can try. Let me see what happens here. I'll talk amongst yourselves while I try to go to share to screen. Okay. Uh, Gentlemen. Another film coming up, a short film. When, 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 when John called. I showed a little of it before. And oh, hold on one second. Oh. Sorry, Duke. Duke, were you saying something? Yes, I was talking to Duke. When I was told, I thought we were going to be on about twenty or thirty minutes. I've got something I've got to go to. Okay, not no worries, Duke. Not Thank you very much. It's been an honor. Duke, was it a, what kind of sound system do you have in the stadium? Pardon? Distributed or uh, point source or semi point? In the Atlanta stadium, it was distributed by cell horns, went down, and there were many thousands of watts. I've forgotten how many, but it was a lot. I know, but we, speak of placement. But it was voice on it, on it. Later, we added low frequency. We added woofer. Right. But did you have a distributed setup or a point source or semi point source? For the Beatles? For in the stadium, it was built into the stadium. The system built in the stadium was distributed around the perimeter of the roof. Okay, down. Cell okay, okay at the back down. of the heads. Okay, but thank you. For the Beatles, we didn't use the, uh, we, the uh, uh, sound system for the stadium. We used speakers on the field. So you use the A7s, 500s. Yeah, yeah, 12 A7s. And then the console was the console. This might have been the Boston I'm familiar show. with the console. This, this one you're looking at is the, the Boston, Boston show, and you can see if I zoom in a little bit, I could move this I out. I wanted of one of those big time. All right, hold, hold on a second, guys. So we got multiple people talking. So Duke, you have to go, right? Yes. All right. I'll give Duke, I'll give Bill your number. Excellent. Thank you awesome. so much. Thanks. Duke. Gentlemen, it's been great to be here. Nice to meet you, Duke. Good to meet all. Thank you, Duke. Thank you, Duke. Thanks. Bye now. All right, take care, Duke. Thank you, sir. Bye, Duke. Bye. Yeah. So if we if we take a look at a couple of pictures here, what you are looking at, you are correct, Barry. This is uh, this is the stage that was built. You imagine at the height of the Beatles' religious controversy, where John says he's uh, the Beatles are bigger than Jesus. Some genius decides to build a structure that looks like a manger for them. <laughs> <laughs> a little irony there. Huh? That that is hilarious. Hilarious. Yes. That's hilarious. But what uh, what Bill did here, the, one of the interesting things about this show, of course, is that it's um, the sound is all coming from a giant wedge. It's all coming from one direction. So he has these voice of the uh, of the theater cabinets and these uh, horns up on the top running the length of the track going down the track and so you can't see it's out of the frame here but off to the uh, I guess as if, as if you were facing the crowd off to the left up the hill was uh, the neighborhood known as Orient Heights I spoke to several neighbors who said oh I'll tell you we heard it great you know you could hear every note you know and especially when the wind blew a certain way you just heard all the details in it so there was a, you know, it was kind of a unique setup there. Uh, if I go to, let's see where else I can go here. Uh, well, that thing's very. And I, By the I, way, that's a that's a great photo, man. There's there's a, a, 
I, I, this is a closer look at the Altec uh, Lansing yep. two hundred and eighty. So this is this is your high end, I guess, right? Is that correct? Yes. Move yeah, yeah. And so yeah. these guys were stacked up on top of those massive speakers, like the uh, in the there enclosures. Were, there were two ten Altec. But these wow. are these are some of the you know brothers and sisters of the stuff that got used uh, at at Suffolk Downs. These are A7s here. This is an A8. These are A2s, A5X, A7B. This is the A7500B set up there. So I think when uh, Duke, we had Duke, I think this is what Duke had ringing the stage in Atlanta. Are those even legal? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine Bill, Bill, you schlepped, you and your crew schlepped those things around a yeah. lot. If you want to see a, a different configuration, this is the show at Cincinnati. Oh, cool. And you can see that, these, that the cabinets are on their side and the horns are placed kind of to the side as well. Um, I wonder if this was because of the visuals uh, involved well, we in this. Trying to, we were trying to bounce the sound after it hit the audience. Angle and refra refraction throws the sound out to the birds and we were trying to keep the echo down in the stadium. So this is a view from the back of Crossley Field. Um, Bill Hanley, you're over in this blobby area here. There's a, there are some other pictures I couldn't quite locate in time for our show tonight. But you're in, down in this area with your board, and they're running cables out this way. And all the speakers are kind of ringing around. Yep. There's one really nice little piece of film. It's only three seconds. Uh, but you this, see it, Hal. Here it is. Oh yeah, yeah. We got to put that on here for you. It's, yeah, uh, there's great. more of this that's in me. my work. Uh, you know, dealing with the uh, Beatles, especially yeah. for the Ron Howard film. We were able to turn up a lot of really cool movies. What I love about this is the camaraderie. I think it's. I think the guy with the long hair here is Mr. Briggs, but uh, I don't know whose back you're slapping there, but somebody you liked. <laughs> and I could see Barry here, and uh, I can see all the guys. Cool. So uh, there's a lot of. I know that uh, Fred Cantor did a wonderful film about uh, the remains that remains to be released. Uh, since the time of that film, I've found so much stuff. So we got we to gotta talk. Uh, let me see what this candlestick PA. This was actually the PA board from Candlestick Park. And they're in the dugout. I think it was the third base dugout that they were in. Nice. And uh, I can't McCune's tell what any of these machines are, yes. but they look at That's, the That's McCune. That's McCune. Yeah, McCune's out. And Abe Jacob was the, uh, was the engineer for that, uh, for that show. I tried to get Abe. I know he would have done it. I could not get a no, contact for Abe Jacob. The configuration at, uh, at Candlestick was different once again. Here's your, I assume that these were monitors, yeah. but they, they kind of set up stacks of like piles of speakers mm -hmm. at either side of the stage on the first and the third base side. So well, that's a slightly different configuration of how they, you know, wired it up for sound for that one. That's a great shot. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Let me see if there's, uh, oh, I'm back to Cincinnati again, aren't I? Let's go back to Candlestick. Uh, here's a look at uh, Candlestick Park. This is uh, the wonderful yes, Mal Evans. Mal, Mal. Yeah. Uh, and really? you can see there's a truck here, and they're are loading up the uh, the Super Beetle amps, right? Wow. Not a huge crew. I, I think this is one of the remains. No. No? Mm, no. No, okay. I think that, is that Mike Owen, was it? Uh, the um, roadie for the circle? Oh, okay. Could be. I think that might have been him. I forget his last name, but Mike. And this gentleman, I, I, his name is escaping me right now. It's but he Freeman. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, Freeman, Mr. Freeman. So yeah, so uh, Ed Freeman. Ed Freeman, that was it. Yeah, he, he got interviewed for our picture too. He was our road manager. There you go. That's right. This and is a, uh, and a this photographer. Was, this was the microphone they used out at uh, at Candlestick. Cool. So they were using AKGs. They were. I think you were using Shure mics for most of the Hanley tour. Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I do a I I'm do a podcast. podcast. Go ahead. And uh, let me stop sharing there. Um, I do a podcast, and I use that exact same microphone that Bill Hanley used at uh, Suffolk Downs. That's how I record all of my 
Beatles Naked podcast. Hey, a little plug. You're not the only one, John. I'm plugging. So uh, <laughs> plug, plug, plug. If anybody's got anything that they're working on, you know, feel free to plug away. You know. Uh, but uh, yeah, if, like check out. Uh, we're on iTunes and stuff. If you like very, very, very in-depth Beatles analysis, uh, I think you'll get a kick out of it. It's a couple of good shows on there for sure. So, uh, but that's it. I just had a few things. I think I've restored. Uh, I think I've stopped sharing. Yep. I think. So I'm going to show uh, Tony, uh, I'm going to show your collection from what I have here that maybe you could talk a little bit about it and then we'll take some questions. Is that, is that okay with everybody? It's great. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. all right. Hold on one second. <clears throat> Let's see here. Navigation. Golden doodle. Golden doodle. I have one. Looks just like her. All right. Golden doodles. Golden doodles. Golden doodles. Yep. My mother calls them a dipsy doodle. Dipsy doodle. <laughs> that was the uh, song. I had just gotten off the uh, IRT number seven subway, and this is walking into the stadium, and I was shocked to see, oh my goodness, there's already banners up on all of the ledges. <laughs> and it was an even mix of women and men, girls and boys. It wasn't yep. all girls. They were just the loudest. Yep. Yeah. They were the noisiest. That first seat of the crowd was where I was first seated. This is now down much closer. Yeah. What city? This is New York. Stadium in New York. Thank you. Can you see the speakers there that are pointed back at the band? Are there actual monitor speakers being used as monitors? I think they were. I don't remember. I, I in my in the book, I I have Bill talking about monitors being used at different venues. In the remains, speak. I forget which one. Which one of you guys mentioned that you remember monitors at various shows? But um, this photo doesn't reveal that. Um, uh, there aren't even side fills here. But uh, I think. Wait, uh, Bill. Over to the the far the the middle right here next to the. All right, is stage right, stage uh, left. You mean stage left? Yeah. Okay. Those black boxes there, sitting on the ground, yeah. um, and then we have these boxes, uh, these uh, these voice of the theaters closest to us. What are they? Shoes. Were these side fills meant to be side fills on the bottom here? They could have been, but I got to get closer. It, it looks to me like they're pointed out into the audience um, yeah. to, to fill the center part of the coverage because the main arrays mm -hmm. are, are, are aimed pretty far out. Yeah. But it uh, looks also like you've got a JBL lens on the top, upside down on top of that box over there, the pair of boxes. Yeah, interesting. Could be. It's a good shot. Both. That's a great shot. Oh, you can also see the station wagon at the back of the stage. Yeah. To get the Beatles off of the stage and off of the field before all hell broke loose, they would clamber into a car and they would get driven to a hole in the wall, quite literally, in center in, in left field. And you can see the, the wagon that they used for their escape at the back of the stage there. Amazing. She doesn't look too excited, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good shot. Yeah. The Beatles are wearing their gray suits with uh, burgundy pinstripes. They had two main stage outfits for this tour, the, for the world tour. And w this was the complete sort of uh, gray outfit. They had a very deep forest green one as well. Uh, and sometimes they would mix and match and use the, the, the top, you know, the dark, the dark jacket with the, with the gray pants and stuff. Um, so they kind of mixed and matched, but really only had those two stage outfits and would do variations. And of course, you can see the, the, the row of policemen. Yes. And on my photo website, um, an actual one of the policemen in that lineup has actually commented and said, thank you, you brought back some great memories. <laughs> nice. Lennon rules. Good shot. That's cool. That is cool. <laughs> and in rules. Look at that. 
All right. I think this might be the end of it. Um, let's see here. Thank you, Tony. Let's take some oh, questions. So Let's nice take, thank you. Yeah, those are great. Yeah. Um, great photos, Tony. Yeah. Yes. I'm so glad. Uh, to nice to see them in focus. That's great. <laughs> Let's see. Let's try to get some questions in because um, we've uh, we've had a pretty steady stream of uh, of folks. So um, I'm going to take go back here a little bit here. Um, Let's see, Neil Porter. Uh, how about the new folks festivals and doing so much research? Trying to, trying to please John with the system. Uh, hey, know. Bill, are you still doing any dates? I uh, know some R and D, but once in a okay. while, we look at MIT's commencement and that stuff. Uh huh. Someone says all of these Boston accents makes me think I'm back at BU. There you uh, go. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't have a Boston accent anymore. I used to have one when I was a kid. I think I still have one. My oh, wife. Oh, God. Okay, so great. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Chachi asks, uh, great panel tonight. Thanks for doing this. Beetle interactions always interest me. Uh, can you all comment on any interactions you had with any of the Beatles directly or Brian Epstein? I know Barry has stories about George Harrison and John Lennon. Yeah, I, I, uh, I got to um, see George years later. Uh, I went to Carl Perkins' funeral. Uh, it, it was uh, it was in Tennessee, and uh, it was close to where I live. And so um, I just happened to get a seat just in the same row with George Harrison, and uh, also. Um, uh, who did Walk in the Dog, Billy? Oh, man. Vern, who did Walk in the Dog? Baby back, dressed in black. Don it wasn't Gray. Willie Dixon, was it? No. No, it wasn't Willie Dixon. I don't remember. Oh. Anyway, they, all those people were in. And after the, the thing was over, I went in the green room and uh, talked to George for about 10 minutes and met his wife, gave him a copy of my book. And, uh, you know, he was, he was really nice. He remembered me and uh, thanked me for the book. And then uh, uh, this guy, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, one of Jerry Lee Lewis's guys came in and said, hey, George, the killer wants to see you. So he, he looked around and said, well, I got to go now. So he. So he went up the stairs and then he turned around and waved to me and just said, all the best. And that's, that's the last I saw of him. And Rufus Thomas. Uh, Rufus Thomas. Yeah. Carla Thomas yeah. and Rufus Thomas were, were in the same row. Yeah. I guess my George Harrison story, I, I, I used to like to listen to Ravi Shankar tapes with him. Oh, yeah. Um, he, had, um, he had been studying with Ravi Shankar. And at night, most of the time, we just couldn't go anywhere. We were under very tight security. And uh, I think, Barry, I think you and I would go up together to George's room sometimes and uh, just sit on the floor and listen to Ravi Shankar cassettes that yeah. uh, he had made for George to listen to while he was on the road. And uh, he was just a wonderful, humble human being. Yes, that's my memory of him. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have, um, I'm offering the uh, opportunity for folks to join us uh, in the Zoom uh, chat room, just, just, as, a, just as a perk. Um, no funny stuff though, or they'll be bounced. <laughs> um, so we have uh, Dennis uh, waiting in the uh, Zoom chat room and I'm offering this to, uh, to folks out there on Facebook. If you wanna join us in the Zoom chat room for, uh, uh, interaction and uh, uh, question, uh, please do so. All right, we'll take um, Dennis. We'll see what Dennis. I don't know Dennis. This is a this is a, a, a you know a, cold call. Yeah, it's a cold. It's a cold call. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know who Dennis is. We're gonna find out who Dennis is. You don't know what he's selling. <laughs> 
Hopefully he's not naked right now. Uh, no, you know. don't, don't introduce <laughs> these things. We'll bounce him. We'll bounce him. I'll throw him <laughs> right out. I'll throw him. The uh, true boss. I'll get him out of here. You know, my boss is actually there. All right, here we go. Dennis. Dennis. Oh, he seems to be there. I see somebody. Dennis. He's trying to connect to the audio, it says there. Hi, hi Dennis. Hi, how are you? I wanted to ask uh, Bill and see if he had any opinions on uh, any current technology or mixing tech consoles. Uh, I saw him last year, and I completely forgot to ask him about that. Say it again. Hey, Bill. Good to yep. see you again. Um, I wanted to ask if um, these days you've seen any new equipment or, or, or equip, you know, mixing consoles specifically that you find attractive or any new features that you think are cool or useful. Uh, I think the most uh, interesting thing is being able to uh, get a visual cue from the microphone in light or LEDs so that you can tell who's doing what to some degree and Absolutely. not counting on your hearing as to what's going on. If you don't know the material, that's well, a really handy tool to have, which we never could do before. And have you had any time to spend uh, on any any mixing consoles specifically? Oh, not any, not in particular, three or four of them. Well, maybe next time you're in New York, you can let me know and we can go and view it if you have any. Uh, okay, I'll be there for the AES. Yeah, that'd be great. I'll definitely see you there. Dennis, tell us about yourself. Where, where are you from? Uh, what do you do? Well, originally I'm from Venezuela, but I ended up, uh, my family immigrated to the States. And uh, my background is mainly a live sound, but I had an opportunity a few years back to become involved with a fairly high prominent uh, mixer, studio mixer. And that took, uh, you know, it was an interesting side trip so to so to speak it was easy to me to you know to when i wasn't working in the city doing live sound to go 20 minutes away nearby and uh you know work with eric clapton and, and people like that cool. so you know it was a, definitely a no-brainer i learned uh, how to be a, a studio assistant um which was uh, an eye-opener um it was different you know, than being live oh quite differently Quite, quite different, but a lot of the things that I'd learned live um, served me well in the studio. Um, one day somebody asked, hey, can you, can you recon a speaker? And I said, hey, yeah, I think so. So <laughs> 20 minutes later, here you go. Cool. Good work. And your thought on the Beatles? Uh, are you a fan of the Beatles? Oh, absolutely a fan. In fact, I am actually currently one of the fill-in mixers for the Fat Paul for monitors. Oh, the Fat Paul, they're great. So they're, very, they're absolutely very stunning. I am uh, uh, through the roof uh, working for those guys. As uh, interesting as a as monitor engineer, is, 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 it's a very demanding job. But then uh, being part of, of people that put such a good show, it's, you know, it's, it, it puts you right through to the roof. It's, it's really amazing. I recommend it. Awesome. Even as a mixer, I recommend it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank, thank you, Dennis, for joining us. My pleasure, guys. Good right. to meet you. All right, take care. Good to meet Likewise, you. Likewise, nice. See you guys. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Take care. Uh, let's see here. Um, we have another someone waiting. In the, this is a very – this this technology and the, the organization of it is great for this sort of thing, I have to say. Um, yeah, it's working out great. Um, and I want to thank everybody that's, I mean, we've consistently had 70 or 80 people watching us. Uh, and um, yeah, some Jim Shelley uh, says the Fab Faux are great. Yeah, the Fab Faux, there's a lot of tribute bands out there now. Uh, what are the remains? What do you guys think of the tribute bands? Have you seen any uh, that uh, that you like or no? Don't even bother. Not especially. Yeah. For me. I, I like the real deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer, Vern. <laughs> Um, I, I, Paul Boothroyd, the, uh, 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 Paul McCartney sound engineer reached out to me, uh, with a personal message and he got a copy of the book and he, he loves it. He's reading it now. So I'm really honored. And that's my little, my little Beatles connection there. Not much aside from being friends with the remains. Uh, it was a real honor to, uh, to hear from uh, a sound engineer at that level, uh, admiring the, the research we have, um, 
Mr. Stein joining us. Uh, let's see. While you're getting uh, him in, uh, I have a question for Barry. Okay. Where did you come up with the name Barry and the Remains? Um, it was, we needed a name. And so we had a party in our apartment and all these people came. One of them was a, a nurse, you know, from a nurse, nursing student from BU. And uh, I said, you know, hey, we, we're trying to find a name. That's what this party is about, name for a band. And she started, you know, throwing out some names and oh, no, no, you know, the, the alligators, you know, or, or the, the, the you know, this and that. Good time. I don't remember the rest of the names, but then she said the remains, and and it was like bingo, that's it, that's it. <laughs> so that's how we got the name. Awesome. All right. So we good have story. Uh, that's a, that's good. So Mr. Stein, hi, uh, welcome to our panel. Uh, we can't see you right now. You're very dark and mysterious. Um, can you hear us, sir? Mr. Stein, you there? Karmik, Karmik. It's you're clipping. Got a loose wire. Yeah. He oh. needs Bill Hanley sound. A loose wire. <laughs> Karmik, do you have a loose wire? Uh, so <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. You're not coming in too clear there. We're going to have to... You're uh, coming in and out. As they say in the radio business, sorry, we're going to have to... Uh, yikes. Bye -bye. Sounds like the son of Monster Magnet. <laughs> <laughs> that was terrible. All right. Kamik, uh, come back in when you have things sorted out. Um, let's see here. All right. John, I'm, I, I was hoping there would be a couple of last questions or something. I, I do have to... Uh, yeah, Tim, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna end this. Um, yeah, I got to run too. All right. Uh, let's see. Thanks for coming. Hey. Yeah, it was great to see you guys. Yeah. Uh, you guys see you members. Great to meet all of you folks, by the way. Hey. My pleasure. Hey. Hey. Well, I'll tell hey. you what, I'll invite hey. all you guys to come to a little Beatles party where we could do it with this technology. I can't, unfortunately, broadcast some of this stuff out on Facebook. But uh, in a closed group, it would be uh, fun to show you guys some things that might really bring you down memory lane a bit. Um, or, uh, you know, especially that film from 66 at Chase Stadium, because it has real sound to it. So you can kind of really feel like you're back there for a couple of minutes. That'd be great. Yeah. We, have, yeah, we have to broadcast it out so we can see it. <laughs> we have a question for, uh, for Bill. Uh, did you ever use any Crown DC 300 amplifiers? Sure. Designed by Gerald uh, Stanley in the 60s. They came out by the summer of love, 67. 155 watts per channel uh, was a lot of power back then. Do you use those often, Bill? We had a half a dozen of them. And we, we liked them, but uh, they had problems grounding the chassis together. They had a isolation resistor between the, uh, they had a common ground at the output stage, and then they put a, a tenth of an ohm or something to the input. So we had problems with them going into para parasitic oscillation. That's oh, a you don't want that. album, Parasitic yeah. Oscillation. That's my next record. That's the name of my Okay, go to it. <laughs> we, have, we have a question. Uh, can Barry and the boys talk about playing the rat in Kenmore Square? <laughs> if we remember. Pretty rotten. Yeah. <laughs> free, be free beer. Funky. Free beer. Um, and that might that might be it. I you know we've been on for a good while. This has been a a rich show. We've covered a lot of of details. I think. And um, any yeah. last any lasting comments from anybody before we? Well, I feel I've been, I feel like in... part, it's like a Thank historical you. document here. <laughs> It is a historical document, exactly right. What were you going to say, Eric? Just say it was just great to see everybody in this format, uh, uh, to see all, you know, this is a way, let's, let's do something like this again. 
That's all you can do. Too. Sounds good. Yeah, it's good. It's fun. We can do a little piece after the, the, the public session is over. Then we can do it ourselves. We, um, the next a great tool. For those who are listening and watching next week, we're doing a, a New York sound uh, panel um, focusing on the, the, the nightclub uh, or the, the venue sound of New York City in the mid to late 60s. Uh, we have a few folks joining us in for that. I mean, if any of you guys are interested to join in, uh, you know, more than welcome to. And then uh, after that, we have uh, the Fillmore East. We have about three or four shows scheduled just on the Fillmore East. Mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of the folks that actually work there and um, I'm putting together that panel and then uh, Woods, Woodstock will be uh, this summer and uh, you know if, hopefully this pandemic doesn't last I mean this is just this is good filler for the pandemic right but you know we all we I think we want to get in get with people physically in the physical space and share these stories uh, uh, rather than be on do them virtually but if this goes on for the summer uh, I have a whole you know kind of schedule planned for these zoom panels well, if we get out of this in time, John, uh, Chachi and I have another one of our Beatles extravaganza shows uh, uh, for John Lennon's 80th birthday at the Regent Theater in Arlington. Uh, so hopefully on October 9th, we'll be free and clear of this because uh, I would say if you want to see some stuff that you've never, ever, ever seen before and really enjoy it, come on by. It's um, everyone, we usually pretty much bang the place out. And when we do these shows and we love being at the, at the Regent, it's a fantastic place for us to do our show. It's kind of like modern vaudeville. <laughs> but we show a lot of really, really cool things you can't see anyplace else. And Is that in Arlington? Yeah, yeah, the one you guys played at one time. Yeah, we played there, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to sign off, guys. Okay, great. Yeah, great, great to see you. Great to see you all. See you soon. Good night, all. Great Thank to you. Everyone. Good night, everybody. Be careful. Stay. You can. Everybody stay, stay safe. safe. Stay safe. Okay, Good thanks. Night, Good thanks, to see guys. you, Vern. Hi, Good to see you guys. Hi, guys. Hi. Good to see you all. Do we click leave meeting? Oh. Is that what we do? <laughs> I think that's it, man. That ends it. That ends our virtual relationship here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Stay in touch. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, oh. everybody. Take care. Just a second. We're going out there. Hi, Tony. Well, you want to say something? No, we, we can only see your, your jacket there, Bill. We're on the Beatles show with John. <laughs> Hello. Barry and the remaining. Good night. Good night, uh, Bye, John. Barry. Stay in touch, okay? Take care. Thank you. Yep. Good night, all. Bye, Ken. Are you staying on? Bye, all. Bye, Ken. Push the button that says. All right. And all right, Bill, I'll give you a call. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, sir. That was fun. Thanks. Where's the button, Rowan?